Hi everyone, Ross here at Teacher Talk. It's 15 remote teaching pedagogical approaches. This is based on four pieces of research recently published, plus some practical ideas from myself, um, of how you can approach remote teaching from a curriculum delivery point of view, ICT leadership and teacher training, and thirdly, just teaching and learning in a remote environment. So here are my 15 suggestions. Number one, develop a digital competency. Now, not all schools will have been prepared for COVID, but for those schools who already have an ICT strategy going on across the school, they would have found themselves quite easily adapting content to working online rather than a potentially a knee-jerk reaction. Um, there are loads of sources of uh, information, so from an English context, Department for Education, Ofsted, you've got the Education Endowment Foundation, and some of you will be old enough to remember the Becta organisation, which published some brilliant guidance back in 2008. Um, instead of reinventing the wheel, there's already lots of recommendations and frameworks out there. See how this can inform your own digital competency for your pupils in your school. Tip number two, it's really important to develop a range of skills from pupils to select to manage not only their mental health, but their ICT use in a wide range of settings, including social media. So hopefully your department or your school not only has the curriculum mapped out, but also the skills and knowledge that will be acquired, as well as underpinning their use of all these devices, you know, cognitive load being permanently online, and how this uh, impacts perhaps on their mental health. Tip number three, adapting content to suit an online curriculum approach. Now, in good schools where schemes of work already exist, it's not just a matter of switching a, a piece of uh, uh, learning or a scheme of learning uh, onto an online environment. It has to be adapted. And of course, what you might do in the classroom in front of students is going to be very different to teaching remotely, uh, whether it's synchronous in live in the moment or asynchronous, such as you watch in this video after I've filmed it. Tip number four, when you're planning your curriculum, always offer opportunities for reflection, take up time. So building in questions, building in quizzes, building in periods to pause, to reflect, to think on what is being shared, uh, what they're being asked to do, and you know how I'm going to respond to you electronically um, in terms of producing a piece of work. So it's really important in uh, when you're looking at your schemes of work to manage how you can build in some time for students to embed knowledge, to respond, and also for the teacher to gather that assessment data. Tip number five is to reinforce material already taught. Throughout the entire pandemic, I've advocated that we shouldn't always be chucking out new material to students, just like we do in the classroom through quizzing and assessment and retrieval practice methods, we should build in this through our online delivery to allow students to recap. It's going to be even more of a challenge for students to remember when they have or may not have the family around them to help support their learning. And if we add into the mix a four-year-old versus a 16-year-old or an adult doing this for their own learning online, how do we build in opportunities to quiz? Well, many of you will take part in some online courses where it asks you to go through various surveys in order to unlock the next stage. Some schools will be buying into those resources. Some may have developed their own. Of course, we know Google Classroom and others have various functionality that allow a sequence of learning to take place. But if you don't have this in place, build in opportunities to reinforce what was taught from before to help build up this retention of knowledge. It just needs to be a 30 second recap in most situations. Tip number six, as we move into ICT leadership and training, is ICT a priority in your school? Now, in my experience, we've always had resources which are generally a little bit outdated compared to the industry sector, you know, business and those types of things. But what we do need to do is build in online learning opportunities for teachers. Who are your early adopters? Who have already mastered these platforms? And how can your school build in training opportunities for your teachers to learn how to use Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Classroom, whatever platform you are learning and help share this wisdom? Tip number seven, as part of this ICT approach to teacher training, we also have to consider how teachers can manage all the technical tools 
to develop an online positive climate for learning. Not an easy feat, particularly if you're dealing with very younger children who may not have that support network at home. So whatever you're using, if you haven't done so already, you need to spend a little bit of time managing the mechanics the safeguard and all the technicalities so that you can allow students, whether they're using their videos, microphones on or off, build that culture of trust. And one little tip to do this is to kind of share pre-recorded video that suggests what your expectations are, how you can manage various kind of opportunities or technicalities in the, in the software. And of course, there's already all these things already online for you. So whether you're producing your own or you're signposting parents to watch this two minute clip on YouTube, do consider how you're gonna build this positive climate on an online classroom environment. Now, tip number eight. I believe it's the number one thing teachers need to know. Understanding memory, cognitive load. There is lots of research to say permanently connected online is going to really add to anxiety and stress. I know being active on social media and on this website, I'm always trying to work out ways to log off and do less. In terms of remote teaching and teachers delivering all their lessons online for five, maybe six hours a day, how can we build in time to reduce cognitive load not only in ourselves as presenters to pupils or other teachers, but how we can help pupils manage their learning in a remote environment with lots of opportunities to have a bit of downtime, to reflect, to reconnect, and build up lots of motivation and engagement through a digital connection. There's a great blog on my site, the number one thing teachers need to know. You'll get a little insight into maybe how we learn, and then you can adapt this back into your own setting and, and the types of pupils that you work with. Tip number nine, now I've already mentioned asynchronous and synchronous video recording. They're really important. My own experiences as a parent, I know that when we've received little video clips from the head teacher or my son's primary teacher, they make a big difference. Of course, it's not always possible for everyone to deliver live content. Sometimes many teachers are also dealing with their own children at home through homeschooling. But where it's possible, or at least at whole system level, again with the technology, do plan in those blended discussions with online opportunities to refine your material in terms of its delivery and consider those live approaches. Tip number nine, in my life as a parent, already my son is receiving video messages from the head teacher and his classroom teacher in asynchronous format, so pre-recorded. It's not possible for everyone, you've got to also consider many teachers are homeschooling their own children at the same time. So it's gonna be a real challenge for many people to deliver live video. In some schools it may be expected, it may be possible teachers that might not have their particularly commitments at home, such as young children. So there's gonna be a full range of challenges and also opportunities. I guess speaking from my own experience as a teacher trainer, a teacher and as a parent, even just the simplest pre-recorded video, just 30 seconds or a minute, is enough to also motivate and engage families watching at home, as well as the pupils, and in the long run, it's going to reduce teacher workload and help reinforce understanding. Tip number 10, now my final tip on ACT leadership training delivery. Analytics is your best friend. You're going to need to find one person in your school who really loves the kind of data side of things. In my life as a school teacher, it was always me. Now, I, I love understanding analytics. One example, when I used to write the whole school newsletter, we'd print it off, email it, send it out, but we'd really not have any deep understanding of who read the information. Now sharing the newsletter to 45,000 teachers, I know exactly who is opening the newsletter, what device they're using, what their approximate location is, and what parts of the newsletter they are reading. And I use all this information to plan what I'm going to share next. Probably not going to have much time to do all this, but there should be one person in your school who is already an expert in this area and is maybe already part of their remit. So with all the videos and voice recordings and all the various resources and links that you're sharing, who can take a look at what is the best engagement for parents, for pupils when they open emails, look at videos and look at resources, and when is the best time to submit a piece of work. All that data is lurking behind the scenes, you just need to take a moment, take a look. Hopefully it will not only drive parental engagement, but will reduce everybody's workload. Now the last stage is teaching and learning, the five ideas. The first one here is pretty obvious, teaching children the importance of plagiarism. I know in my life as a computer science teacher, often teaching children how to copy and paste images and also add references. So I know this is a given and it's probably not a priority right now, but as part of your curriculum delivery and developing skills, 
do teach plagiarism because let's face it, it's gonna come back to haunt all of us, particularly teachers who are bloggers, teachers who write books, and where we might use our academic references for writing our own papers for master's degrees and PhDs. We need to understand the importance of plagiarism and copyright and what you can and cannot do. And I do think that should be taught at a very early age. Now tip number 12 here is just planning for engagement. So it's the simple things such as planning an interest in starter activity, an interesting question, did you know that Ross is eight foot two inches tall? And whether that fact is true or false, it elicits a more conscious type of thinking in our brain. So the most creative and energetic teachers, and I guess you can be energetic when you're 50 years old, is working out ways to hook your pupils. And this comes from having a really good grip on knowing your pupils very well and your parental community. So uh, mix it up, you might not always have an opportunity, but you might want to just find a regular slot in your week during this remote teaching period and work out ways to hook people in and look forward to receiving your email or your video instruction, whatever it be. So uh, plan something interesting to engage your learners. Tip number 13, modeling and explaining. Now we know the best teachers regularly model. Now whether I'm doing it on the board and through remote teaching, I'm always pausing. Pausing allows, and I'll come back to this point in a moment, allows us to reduce cognitive load, uh, reflect, but it also builds in a little bit engagement. Now, whether I'm modeling the board or also referencing the material, I'm a big fan of using visualizers. Um, this is an IPVO model, it's a Wi-Fi version, pretty robust piece of kit. You can get a smaller version. Um, many teachers are using these devices now. They're really good for um, zooming in, modeling, dissecting, all those types of things. A simple switch, connected computer, you can flip from the camera, uh, watching this now, to the camera under the, uh, the visualizer. You know, when we're in the classroom, we know it's a great piece of kit to show students work. But there's lots of other ways you can do this remotely but at least people can see what I'm doing on the desk modeling an example answer so model think out aloud and explain in great depth your thoughts to help students understand remotely tip number 14 questions 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 I'm a big fan of teachers building a wide range of questioning strategies how many questioning strategies do you know now it's also important to emphasize here it's not the number of questions that you ask in the class, it's the type of questions and when they're used. Now on that note, how do you pose lots of questions remotely? Of course, you've got all these kind of quizzing bits of software that you can use, but if you're doing that video where you're watching live with the students, you've then got the technical aspects to manage, whether it's a survey, muting and unmuting various microphones. So definitely have the range of question strategies in your psyche, part of your teacher DNA then just working out how to adapt this in a remote environment. Or if you're doing a recorded video such as this one, how many people might watch this video on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram? There's a, an interesting question. Um, now it's an asynchronous question here. And again, a how many question is what's called a Fermi question based on statistics. Of course, there's lots of possibilities, but that how many type question gets the discussion and the thinking working straight away. So give it a go and there's loads of others on Teacher Talk you can check out. The final tip is number 15, timely feedback. This is a challenge doing it this remotely. Um, we know that feedback comes in many forms, verbal feedback, written feedback, and non-verbal feedback. Um, we also have feedback, feed up, feed forward. So this is all explained on my site. When we have to make feedback manageable for teachers, it needs to also be meaningful for the students and motivate them to want to do the work for you. At the same time, it has to be timely. So how do you do this in a synchronous and an asynchronous environment? Well, obviously live, you can provide that feedback as students are working on a document and you've got your camera or your microphone on mute and then you switch it on and you pose questions and provide feedback. But in an asynchronous environment, of course, a small 10, 30 second little video clips, uh, voice recordings. I'm a huge fan of a piece of software called Kaizena, which allows me to add voice recordings onto the students' documents so they can at least hear me if I'm not in a 
particular school or comfortable with sharing live video content. Yeah. So there's loads of strategies there. There's all 15 for you. Designed as curriculum delivery, ICT leadership and training, and teaching and learning strategies. This is also influenced by four pieces of research, all on the blog that you can see inside the resource. And I've added in one or two templates to help you. I hope it gives you some ideas. I know many schools are already way deep into this, so I've got a good grounding already. But you'll be surprised there's one or two schools still struggling who don't have the resources or the capacity so I hope this video gives you some ideas uh, and the support and resources give you a teacher training resource that you can use back at base with your own teachers. And um, thanks for watching, get in touch if you have any questions.